Hi everybody, Dr. Brown, the CFS doc here. And today I want to talk about how I get out of a crash. So everyone with CFS kind of understands what I mean when I say a crash. I was calling it a crash before I even knew what chronic fatigue syndrome was. And I've had other patients use similar language. Suddenly your symptoms will get so much worse that it feels like you can't function. You're just kind of, and, and this differs, this differs for everybody. Cause you know, sometimes I'll, I'll ask somebody, you know, when was the last time you crashed? And they said, Oh, I've never been that bad. I've never been bad to the point where I couldn't get out of bed. That's not exactly what a crash means. A crash is a drastic reduction in function compared to your baseline, your normal. So if you have very mild CFS, a crash may not look like you being in bed. It may look like you being in the house or needing to take time off work um, or simply like, not not doing the things you would normally be able to do though most often i think when we're crashing we do end up in bed or on the couch for at least a good portion of the day and then for those of us who are who are much worse um you know being couch or bed bound most of the day may be their normal so their crash is also going to look different. So I had a, an experience not too long ago that I'm going to use as kind of an example of how I get out of a crash. And this is going to be a very simplified explanation because my crash situation was extremely self-limited and physical. They're not all like that. Sometimes you're crashed because of something chronic or because of something emotional. And the recovery from that sort of crash is going to look a little bit different, be a little bit more complicated. But the general principles that I share with you will still apply. And I'm going to use this as an example because it'll prove how fast I can go from, well, one, being asymptomatic, two, being crashed, and second of all, how fast I can get out of that state and back up to normal. So my current baseline of functioning right now is asymptomatic. I don't have any symptoms on a day-to-day -day basis. I don't avoid any particular activity. I don't avoid exercise. I do take care of myself. If I have a virus, then I'll rest. I'm not, you know, skipping out on a whole bunch of sleep or, you know, doing things that I, I know are bad for me and uh, over time will get me back into that state but I am asymptomatic and I consider myself in remission. But I did have an experience a couple of months ago where I ingested gluten on accident. Um, and gluten is one of the triggers for me that will immediately cause a crash every single time. It doesn't matter how well I'm doing. I do... I have a history of other food intolerances. Those have all healed, um, but gluten, I, I don't think it's ever going away. So anyways, um, I was out of town visiting some family. I got some gluten in my system and about 10, 15 minutes later, um, I, I could not move. I could not speak. Um, let me turn a corner to try and get this sunlight out of your eyes. Sorry, sorry guys. There, that's better. Now it's in my eyes. 
Um, so I went from feeling completely fine to for the acute phase, um, just minutes after the ingestion, I could not speak. I could not communicate to my family that I was in distress. Um, I felt extremely dizzy. Um, I was just laying on the couch, kind of holding on for dear life, as you do. Um, and along with these physical symptoms also came this very distinct emotional symptom of panic and anxiety. When I'm in an asymptomatic state, I don't suffer from anxiety or depression. So I can tell you for sure that at least in my case, anxiety and depression are symptoms of my chronic fatigue syndrome and they get worse acutely when I'm in an acute flare. So it, it was a really rough time, um, but I kind of had my emergency protocol and I knew what to do. So first of all, I understood that there was a histamine, a large histamine release in my body that was dropping my blood pressure and preventing good blood flow to my brain. And that's why I felt dizzy. And that may also be where a lot of the fatigue comes from. I knew that there was a large inflammatory response. And the best thing I could do was help my body with its circulation by lying down. So I laid down on the couch, completely horizontal, and I just laid there. And after that acute phase passed, that took maybe 20 or 30 minutes, um, I was able to communicate that I had crashed. Um, it was kind of difficult to, to explain all that because, of course, I wasn't talking easily or well. Um, and my, my family didn't really understand exactly what was going on. Um, but I was able to communicate what I needed. And this, this is a skill because it can be hard to ask for things sometimes. Um, but I was able to ask for a dark, quiet room, to be left alone, to be given food and water. Um, I think I may have actually requested electrolytes or broth or something of that nature. And that's it. Like, I told them, I'm going to be in bed for the next several days. Um, just, just leave me to do my own thing. I'll be okay. Um, I just need to be provided with meals and fluids and given time to rest. So I was given a place where I could lay down. I covered my eyes and I laid down. Now at this point, I was feeling well enough that I was capable of being bored. Um, and so the, the laying down and not listening to anything, not watching anything, it was a very conscious, conscious decision. And one that it was quite difficult to make at the time, but I knew that I needed it because the sensory information that you get from screens, from sounds, they all are stress on your nervous system. And when you're in a crash and you're trying to get out of that, you want to reduce the stress on your nervous system to the bare minimum. So I laid down and I think I did fall asleep fairly quickly. 
I, by the way, a lot of my patients are given the kind of generic sleep hygiene advice not to sleep during the day. And in some specific cases, um, there's some validity to that. But especially when you're flared up, sleep. It's, it's really good for your nervous system. Um, that, that rest, that complete quiet, it does allow for faster recovery. Um, there have been times when I was uh, starting to recover but wasn't fully there yet that I went for a walk. I felt like I had overdone it. Um, I was quite tired and I, I expected that I would be crashed the next day. But I laid down, I took a nap, and I didn't crash. I actually felt fine. So I think that there are times when naps during the day can prevent a crash or help you to recover from a crash. However, they do get to be problematic when you sleep, 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 and then you go through these periods where you can't sleep and you have really bad insomnia. Still trying to figure out a good way to balance those two. So none of this is medical advice. It's stuff to bring up with your doctor and try and figure out what works best for your situation. But just be, take it with a grain of salt when they give you kind of the generic sleep hygiene advice because um, it doesn't always work for us. We have kind of a different thing going on. So I spent roughly four hours in that state of sleeping or dozing. Um, I did have a lot of anxiety come up. I forget if that was before or after the nap. But what I did for that was I kind of walked myself through some guided meditations. Guided meditations are something that I've practiced with, I have a lot of fun with, so that was very calming for me. I encourage you to find something that works for you. Find something that you can do with your mind when your eyes are closed, nothing's going on, that's going to bring you a sense of calm. The other benefit of the guided meditation for me is that it brings my attention and my awareness to my body. So I do incorporate a bit of mindfulness or um, body scanning, you know, ways where you bring a non judgmental sort of attention. To the sensations, especially the sensations that are causing you distress. I forget what exactly it was that was bothering me, whether it was shortness of breath or pain or palpitations or, or simply the heaviness of my limbs, but I was definitely feeling distressed and anxious at that time. And I was able to use my visualizations to reframe those sensations as something less scary, as something neutral. And that was very helpful for me. So after several hours of almost forcing myself to be still and not do anything, I did feel like I had calmed down and you know I didn't feel less fatigued but I did feel less anxious and that was my sign to myself that okay I can start incorporating more things because I know that if there's a bunch of anxiety and tension in my body if I ignore it and I don't address it, if I just distract from it, it never goes away. And 
it, it, I don't recover as quickly when I do that. So after I had addressed the anxiety, then I, I forget what it is I listened to. It may have been an audio book or it may have been some guided meditations, but I allowed some gentle auditory stimuli and a little bit of distraction. And after several more hours of that, I eventually did incorporate um, a video game on my computer that was not going to spike my adrenaline. Um, and I have to be very, very careful when I play video games because I will sometimes notice that I'm holding a lot of tension in my body while I'm playing. And this will happen even for kind of the more the more gentle games, Minecraft or, or strategy simulations, which um, I enjoy. But I have to be careful. And if I'm not able to relax as I play those, and I'm in an acute flare, then I will forego those or take them in very small doses. And I continued like that in bed for several days. Um, I think it was on day four that we were scheduled to fly back home. And so I, I, at that point, I was well enough to actually handle all of the walking and stress that comes with um, boarding a, and, and flying. Um, and I did okay with it, but I rested very, very strictly for those three or four days between becoming flared and getting on the plane. And when I got back home again, I laid down and I was very, very quiet and calm. And I was able to overcome that crash quite rapidly, probably within two weeks. Two weeks is pretty good. In the past, you know, after I've developed the capacity to recover from flares, but those flares have been caused by more chronic issues like residency, it has taken me one to two months to, to really feel somewhat well again. And usually that's just because I'm still somewhat in that stressful situation that got me there in the first place. Whereas in this case, the stressful situation was a one-time poisoning and then it was over. Yeah, so that's how I deal with a crash and how I get out of them. I would love to hear your stories of how you get out of crashes. Obviously, if crashes are caused by different things or, or even our chronic fatigue syndrome is caused by different things, then our ways of overcoming a crash will be different from person to person. So please let me know what you found to be helpful for you. So please like, subscribe, and I'll see you on the next one. Bye.